and you're good. Thank you, Tony. Okay, thank you, Chris. So I am, um, you know, I'm an engineer, so I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but this is from an engineer's perspective. And, and, and if you're going to do engineering, you have to read the science. So you, you can't avoid that. Uh, this is part two. It's the evolution of the earth. Uh, reminder that the, uh, the earth is a, is a dissipative heat engine, just like a, um, a, a steam engine. And the sun is the, uh, the hot reservoir. The surface is 5,770 degrees K and uh, empty space is uh, 2.73 Kelvin. And, uh, and that allows the earth uh, to sit right in the middle of, well, point uh, at a nice comfortable range 288 k which is about 15 um, degrees c and about 60 degrees um, fahrenheit um, there's a lot of information on this but the point is is everything on earth and the earth system including the human economy is also a dissipative heat engine or dry it's driven by the sun uh, so this is this week's lecture uh, next time we'll talk about the evolution of civilization um, and, and including uh, right up into the to, to, to where we are today with it. There's a current extinction event. It's called the Holocene extinction. It's they've given it a name and of course, climate change. And then part four, uh, I want to talk about possible futures in two parts because I have to split it up into economics and energy. I have a lot to talk about both topics. Um, uh, these are these are four books. If anybody's interested, uh, my source books. Uh, and 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 you and Nisbet gives us a good good talk about climate and deep time from the Archean to the Ice Ages. So that's a very good book. I mean, a very good uh, lecture. Uh, Nisbet has been in the news this week uh, because of the methane uh, problem that we're just experiencing. So. This is what we learned in part one. We, 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 we talked about, this is from Donald Rumsfeld, if you remember him, the, he, the known knowns, the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns, and things we know for sure, which just ain't so. And, but he left off the last category, and that's the latter. That is the stuff that gets into, into trouble. Um, following from that, Roger Penrose uh, observed that we need to separate true from false before we can separate good from bad. And so if you start believing stuff that isn't true, uh, you can have the best intentions, but you, you might do more harm than good. Uh, science is not perfect, but it is the only reliable way to discover truth. Uh, the periodic table of elements, for example. But it, in its absence, we must make assumptions. Uh, but, but we have to keep separate the, uh, what, we, what we are assuming, which has very little evidence uh, against what we know to be true, like the periodic table of elements, which has significant evidence, and we know it's true. So the difference between critical thinking and ideological thinking is, is that critical thinkers are willing to be wrong, and they don't take their assumptions too seriously. Uh, and, and finally, we, we, we went on to, 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 to really get into the meat of the matter with the universe. And we, we, we looked at the, uh, we, the laws, our approximate laws are approximate to the laws of nature. Uh, but they're really good approximations because the, 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 the uh, internet that you're listening to me and, your, and the e-device that you're listening to me on, they all work really, really well. Um, uh, the universe had to play out over some time, billions of years to be able to host life. We saw that our own sun was a 40th generation, 40, 40th generation uh, star. Uh, the universe began in a state of low entropy. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, the universe works to maximize entropy using up free energy. And we talked about what entropy was and free energy. Um, energy conversion, entropy production, drive life, the universe, and the human economy, and everything. And this is why it's important to have understood this. Uh, most stars in increase their illuminance over time. And we talked about why, because, because that is how fusion works. And, and in fact, that's in fact how our sun works. Um, so what we will consider in part two is the habitability of, of a planet depends on whether or not it's inhabited. So there's feedback between the, the, the environment that life finds itself in and, and, and life influencing its own environment. 
Life is far from thermodynamic equilibrium. It's in a low entropy state and, and requires a flow of energy to maintain that state. And therefore, we're, we're, we're using up free energy and increasing total universal entropy. Uh, carbon dioxide is the principal greenhouse gas. Um, and that's what we'll learn. Um, but it's not the only one. And more than 30 extinction events happened during the Phanerozoa. Uh, we always hear about the big five and it's just the sixth extinction, but there's actually been at least 30 extinction events. And this is already characterized as somewhere in the middle of those 30. At least three mass extinctions were caused by organism, by an organism developing a new metabolism and or a new reproductive trick. We're the fourth. And so you can see this is not on, well, it's rare. But it's only three times that I know of, but it, it does happen. And it has happened in the past. Uh, and we'll, 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 we'll look at that. And a planet probably has to be billions of years old to develop complex life. We just look at the history of the earth. And, and for all we know, all these exoplanets they're discovering would have had to spend a similar amount of time before they, they, they could harvest, uh, have an, uh, host complex life. We're emitting carbon dioxide 10 times faster into the atmosphere than the most extreme event during the Phanerozoic. And that was the worst extinction event of, of all time. That was the end uh, Permian. And we'll compare uh, the current extinction event to that. And we are burning about a million years of sequestered carbon every single year. And we'll show that too. And uh, moving on, what we did last time was we, uh, we used our telescopes and and we looked into deep space. But when you look into deep space, you're looking back in time because of the finite speed of light. And, and we gathered all this evidence along this path. And that's the bulk of evidence that, that astronomers present. And that we use that to understand the universe. Um, to, to do uh, geology and paleoclimatology and paleontology, we basically are looking back on, on at rocks on the earth and using, in, in, in a sense, microscopes. Although you can see a lot of um, fossils with the naked eye, a lot of fossil work is done with microscopes and, and chemi chemistry. Now, there, there, there's, there's, I think, confusion. Um, the, uh, we hear a lot of, of, uh, of uh, what do you call headlines that say something like the planets in pearl or uh, will this battery technology save the earth? And, and uh, that's a little overstated. The earth will survive us nicely. The earth is, and the, is not in trouble at all. We're in trouble. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, but a lot of people throw around the word world and, and nobody has a real, I think everybody in their own mind has a different idea of what the world means. So I'm going to define it. Uh, as usefully, it's the Earth system, and this is a this is a scientific uh, definition, and uh, it's in this paper down here, and uh, it's a single planetary level complex system composed of the biosphere, and uh, it includes the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the hydrosphere is water, oceans and rivers and lakes, and cryosphere is ice and snow, and the upper part of the lithosphere, which is the crust. And and we could and, and we could draw boundary conditions. So this is the surface of the earth where, where all life is. And, and 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 so we have a boundary condition to deep space, and uh, we can define that, and we have a boundary condition to, to deep the interior of the earth, and we can define that. We can define the the energy and materials that pass between the earth system and those two uh, uh, su subsystems, if you will. Okay, and, and we in this equation, if you're not mathematically fluent, that just means the change of the Earth system with respect to time, and it does change, is a function of A, G, and I. A represents astronomical forcing, so change in the solar irradiation, for example. G represents geophysical forcings, and that could be volcanism. And I represents internal dynamics, and this includes biosphere uh, evolutionary processes. And we'll see examples of all three of these things. So I'm here claiming that the world, the, the good definition for the world is the earth system. And that does change and has changed over time. And so the world we live in today 
is extremely different from the world that the dinosaurs lived in, but it's different still from the world as it existed um, back in four billion years ago. Okay, so uh, Axel Clyden wrote a book called The Thermodynamic Earth, and, and it's a difficult read. It's a, it's a graduate level textbook, and you really have to have an undergraduate physics degree to understand it. So I, I don't, but he does give a good lecture here on YouTube and, 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 and it's, that's very interesting and, and, and accessible. But basically he models the earth system like this as a thermodynamic engine, uh, has a gain of energy from the sun, solar radiation, uh, loses energy uh, by, by radiating heat energy back into space because we can do that because we're hotter than that, 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 the 2.7 degrees of the, uni of the universe. And, and also there's internal heat generated from, uh, generated, uh, from um, radioactive breakdown, uh, radio decay of uh, uranium and things like that. But also um, they're, they're just gravity. Gravity is pushing the, the earth. And so the earth core is, 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 is hotter than, the, than its surface, just like the sun's core is hotter than its surface. And uh, biotic activity rides in that crust uh, being influenced by all these things. And, and, and human activity is a, is a part of biotic activity. So this is the human economy. It is a heat engine and it has inputs and outputs, which unfortunately economists ignore. Um, so to determine, we have, we're, we're discovering a lot of exoplanets and I think we're up to at least 5,000 and maybe closer to 10,000 exoplanets now. And, uh, and, and, and in trying to determine what the climate might be like on an exoplanet, there are three factors. Uh, one is the, uh, the energy received from the star at the uh, surface of the planet. And, and so this, this equation would give it for the Earth. It's 13, 1,361 watts per meter squared. Then there's the surface reflectivity of the planet. So uh, a white, whitish planet would reflect most of the energy and a dark planet would absorb most of it. Um, and this, the, the al it's called albedo. And the albedo is actually a function of of, uh, of space. Uh, you, ha you have the ice caps, they're white, they reflect most of the energy. Um, uh, and and, and uh, with the oceans are dark, so they absorb most of the energy. And that's why as, as the ice caps and the, uh, and the, uh, um, the, the ice, uh, ber icebergs melt away, uh, they're, they're replacing a white surface with a dark surface. And that, that's an additional warming of the planet. Uh, but but if we just take those two factors, the effective temperature of the Earth would be minus 18 degrees C, which is about zero degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the actual temperature of the Earth is about 15 degrees C or about, I think that's about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So the greenhouse effect is, 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 uh, is, is uh, responsible for 33 degrees C. And, uh, and that's factor delta F. And again, this is uh, it's based on the composition in the atmosphere mostly carbon dioxide for the earth, but, but also methane, nitrous oxide, and, and, and a lot of man-made components. Ozone is a, is a, um, is a greenhouse gas, and, uh, and there are several others. And th throughout the history of earth, um, this has uh, uh, the, the important, this has this con const, this thing has changed, as have this and this. Okay, so, I, I, um, we learned last time that the that any star, and this is the um, the sun, to with the sun as well, will get warmer or hotter or or, or more luminous with age. And so, back about three point eight billion years ago, when we believe life first formed, it was only seventy five percent as bright as it is today. And ex we explained this last time why this happens, the, uh, the, the physics of, of in, in, in internal to a star, that it's based on uh, the way fusion works with gravity. And, uh, and um, this was known in the 60s, how this worked. In, in 1972, Carl Sagan and George Mullen uh, wrote this famous paper in the journal Science, and they characterized this as the faint young sun paradox. How could life possibly have formed and when the Earth should have been frozen over solid and be and 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 have been um, uh, hundreds of degrees, you know, like minus a hundred degrees, and uh, so what kept it warm? 
And, and we have evidence not only that of life forming, but also of liquid water. And, uh, and what happens is, is partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over time. It, it, uh, back then, uh, when, when life was first forming, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, there was a thousand to 10,000, these are orders of magnitude. So it was between a thousand and 10,000 molecules of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for every one today. And, and when you work out the equations in the IPCC, you find out that, that that's pretty much what you needed. There was also a lot of methane and, uh, and other greenhouse gases. So uh, it wasn't just up to the carbon dioxide. And there's a band here. And because carbon dioxide isn't, doesn't, it, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't get pulled out. It's not monotonic like, like, uh, like solar radiation. What happened is, it, you know, so it bounces around based on, on geology um, and, and also eventually life. And uh, when it's at near the top, what we have is, uh, is a hothouse earth and near the bottom, we have a, an ice age with, with, with polar, polar ice. At these two points, it, it got so low, um, it was still two orders of magnitude greater than, 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 than today, but uh, be, because of the faint young sun, the earth froze over solid. There wasn't enough carbon dioxide. And, and it did it again here in the, uh, in, in, in the early, late Precambrian. And so we'll look at those, those we'll look at this event, the, at least we won't, this event was a, a similar, so we won't really do that. But anyway, here we are today. Um, why is, is uh, carbon dioxide important? Uh, these are measurements uh, from NASA, did these measurements and in different places on earth, mid latitude and, and subarctic and in different times in the summer and winter, this is the radiation of Earth back into space. Uh, this is the theory, black body radiation using Planck's uh, law. And you can see carbon dioxide is, is an absorber right at the peak of, of, of Earth's radi um, thermal radiation into space. And, and it's nowhere near saturation. It can go deeper. And when it goes deeper, this gets broader. Uh, so. Uh, you can see water vapor is at the flanks. It absorbs out here and it absorbs, it's a big absorber out here. Uh, CH4 absorbs here, ozone absorbs here, and other greenhouse gases, uh, I guess they just didn't show up in, 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 in these measurements. But now you can understand why carbon dioxide is actually pretty, pretty, pretty important relative to all the other gases. Now, uh, I'm going to show a bunch of timelines like this. And this is the environment on the top, and this is life on the bottom. And, and things that happen in the environment, uh, uh, downward blue hours, arrows here, uh, impact life. And then life uh, does, does some pretty major things to influence its own environment. This is actually, actually not, there, there are discrete times when, when big things have happened, either in the environment or with life. But for the most part, this is constant. There's a constant feedback between the two where life is continually change, modifying its environment and the environment's continually uh, evolving and, 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 and forcing life to evolve. So these are eons. This is the first eon, it's the Hedin eon. It's, uh, it's five, 700 million years old. Uh, I just learned that, the, that, that, that before the Hedines, uh, it, was, it, was the, it was called the Che Ocean. And, uh, and this is when the moon formed. And so let's look at that. So this is where the solar system formed. This is, a, this is not in this nebula, but in, in a similar nebula. Uh, this is the tarantula nebula, I believe. Yeah, the tarantula nebula. Uh, this is a 2022 picture. It's very recent uh, from the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And, and, and it's, this, this is the remnants of, of um, supernova. So when supernova blow up, those stars, they, they outgas all of this stuff, heavy elements and all kinds of things. And, and that forms this massive clouds. Uh, the, a lot of these stars are new, newly forming stars out, out, of this, uh, out of this gas. Uh, and again, it's gravity. It's gravity that's pulling stuff back together again until it gets an, has enough stuff that it can light up. Here's a picture. Uh, this is an actual star that's just forming. Um, 
It was December 2021, so it's recent. And this is its uh, planetary disk. So right now, this is your young star. Uh, the 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 uh, the planets have not yet, uh, you know, um, uh, pulled them, you know, formed out of the out of the cloud. And uh, uh, so this is this is what our um, solar system looked like, and 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 uh, gradually through the work of gravity. Uh, planetesimals would form, and then planetoids, planet, and then and then they would clump together and actually form the planets. And when the planets are formed, they're sweeping through a lot of dust and debris, and and so there's an awful lot of collisions. Uh, the birth of the moon happened, and this is when the when the um, Hadean started. Uh, two two planet. Toids, uh, Theia and Telus formed on the on the uh, Earth's orbit, and they collided four and a half billion years ago. And and the debris from the co collision formed the future Moon, and these guys, uh, you know, combined. Uh, just in November this year, um, this paper was released, and and they they claim that these clumps of matter in the interior of the Earth. So this is the Earth. This is our, our core, and these clumps of matter were left remnants of uh, Theia that never got absorbed into the into the into the uh, core. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting paper, but they keep finding more and more evidence that in fact that's 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 that that this collision is what happened. This is what Hadean looked like. Remember, I said the Earth is is sweeping out. It, it, it's it's orbit, so it's constantly being bombarded during during the Hadean with uh, meteorites and and uh, and asteroids and stuff. The moon forms here. It's very close to the Earth when it first forms, so it's huge. And uh, and the Hadean, the, the the surface is just a boiling mass of molten rock, and 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 the the, the water outgassed with the heat from the rock, because rock does contain some water, and uh, and it's and it and it was all water vapor. So there's our future oceans. Um, so how do we know the Earth is four and a half billion years old? And it's called isotope mass spectrometry, specifically uh, uranium uh, lead geochronology. Uh, you met, you are probably all familiar with carbon fourteen dating. So you know and. It, Maybe you're opening up a National Geographic or on TV. They announce a new a discovery in in um, in Peru, for ha perhaps, or or the Middle East of a of a of a um, and uh, some kind of new settlement or 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 whatever. Uh, and they date it to be six thousand years old or ten thousand years old. They're using carbon fourteen dating, and and they'll often say carbon we carbon dated it to eight thousand years ago or something like that. So this is what they're doing. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years, so it's very appropriate for archaeological dating, uh, but it, you can't use it to tell, to, to, to tell deep time because it all, it's all gone in 50,000 years. And C-14 decays into nitrogen-14. And so you just do the ratio of your carbon-14 into nitrogen, and that tells you how old that, that, that thing is that you dug out of your, um, your archaeological site. Um, Uranium-235 and 238 also decay with enormous half-life, 700 million or 4.5 billion years, into two species of lead. And so you, you can find certain minerals called zircons and measure the ratios of 235 and 238 to their lead species. Um, and that's a, that's a good estimate for, for when that rock was formed. Um, and, uh, and and potassium argon dating is also useful for deep time. And there's other um, un unstable, um, uh, what do you call it? Isotopes that 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 that, that, that um, decay into into something else, and 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 you can use that for intermediate times. Um, the, but there's also uh, carbon has carbon 12 and carbon 13, these are stable, they last forever. Oxygen has O16 and O18, O18, it, when it forms in water, it's called heavy water. Uh, sulfur has four stable isotopes. Many inorganic processes and organic processes mass fractionate these. So what that means is they favor uh, the heavy element or the lighter element. 
so when they when they they find they, they, this isn't useful for dating, but it's useful for finding other properties of uh, of uh, say a rock sample or a piece of ice core from uh, from the Arctic, uh, and it tells you temperature and other information about the environment at that time. Um, so we go through the Hadean, and 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 we had to the Hadean had to to be experienced by the Earth for seven hundred million years, and it ended up with the late heavy bombardment about four about four billion years ago, and 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 life couldn't possibly have have formed on the Earth for that time, but finally uh, the, the environment was copacetic for life. It had a reduced atmosphere. There was no oxygen, no ozone. Uh, and, and methane and carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. And, 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 but it was co copacetic for, for the kind of chemistry needed to, to, to start life. Uh, and the origins of life would include lipid cell walls and they form naturally, uh, that's inorganic process. Uh, RNA, DNA, proteins, uh, genetic code and metabolism all needed to happen. The first uh, organisms uh, uh, had, did an oxygenic photosynthesis. This means non-oxygen photosynthesis. They, they, they pretty much use sulfur. We'll talk about that. And methanogenesis, uh, and we, they produce methane and fixed nitrogen. So the other, all the other organisms needed the nitrogen and the methanogenesis uh, uh, supplied the atmosphere with plenty of methane to keep the planet warm. Now, um, the Archean looked like this because of the methanogens. Uh, we're pumping a lot of uh, methane and, and other or organic uh, molecules. It, it was had a purple haze. Notice the moon is, is much smaller now, but it's still much larger than it, than it, than it is today. It's moving further and further away. Uh, so there are four origin of life hypotheses. Uh, panspermia, tidal pools, radiation from the young sun. This is a new one to me, and and hyperthermal vents, hydrothermal vents. And this is the the most common one, and the one that's most talked about or, or believed. Uh, there's there's thousands of of definitions of life. There's as many definitions of life as there are biologists. Uh, I like this one from Jeremy England uh, because this. Every species of living thing can make a copy of itself by exchanging energy and matter with its surroundings. And this allows us to identify viruses as life. And having had COVID, <laughs> I, I, I like, kind of like to think that those guys are alive. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the first one, panspermia. What that means is, uh, and this is a new paper, March uh, 2023. They've discovered uh, using, um, no doubt, using um, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, a lot of prebiotic molecules of, of uh, complexes of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen that have formed in that planetary nebula that we talked about. From you know, from and they and, they, and in the paper they they give um, uh, you know a hypothesis of why that happened, but they have discovered these guys and. Um, and uh, so when, the, when a planet forms, and no doubt our planet, uh, out of a uh, 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 planetary nebula, it, it, it came with a lot of interesting precursors to life, you know, prebiotic molecules. So that's interesting. And that might have ha probably happened anyway, because we, we've discovered those molecules. Uh, the, the tidal pools is... Um, is uh, this is another paper this year. Um, uh, there would be th these tidal pools would fill with water and then evaporate, fill with water. And this is a, a good, they've, they've been able to, to grow amino acids in this type of environment. Um, uh, again, this is a new paper for, for this year. Uh, Super flare sparks of life and how a stormy young sun may have kickstarted life on Earth. Um, formation of amino acids and carbolic acids in weakly reduced planetary atmospheres, which we have a reduced planetary atmosphere. We know that by solar energetic particles from the young sun. So that's another way these prebiotic molecules could have formed. And then the, 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 the favorite is that hyperthermal vent, hydrothermal vents. 
uh, there's a source of energy because the, the hydrothermal vent itself is about 350 degrees C. Uh, the, the ocean itself is two degrees C. So there's a, a warm, um, you know, hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. So you have energy flow. And you also have a lot of, uh, of the um, molecule, molecules and, uh, and, and um, minerals that you need to support life. And, and, and here's hydrogen sulfide. So keep that in mind because we're going to revisit that. Um, uh, also uh, CH4 and, and CO2. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. And so probably all three of those things, are, all four of those things might have been factors. So we got that, we got those we got the starters from the from the uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the cloud, the nebula, uh, the sun, and its activity helped create some more in the atmosphere, and then maybe metal pools created some more, and they all ended up near the hydro hydrothermal vents, and and we got real life going. So it's possible that all four played a role. Now we're talking about the Archean eon, and that. Uh, um, that, that ended with this great oxidation event. And uh, re remember I said, this is a reduced atmosphere and no ozone. The great oxidation event is when cyanobacteria invented oxygen photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis had already been invented, but it wasn't using oxygen. It, it was you, or water, it was using hydrogen sulfide. And, uh, and, 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 and these are the first guys that use oxygen photosynthesis and, and they spit out all this oxygen and, and they, they oxidized the atmosphere. So they made a major change to the environment of the earth. So photosynthesis, green sulfur bacteria, these were the first, and purple bacteria used hydrogen sulfide as an electron donor and, and, and to fix carbon dioxide. So they stripped the hydrogen off the sulfur, released the sulfur back out into the, into the ocean and took the hydrogen and affixed it to carbon dioxide to form CH you know, this is a, a simple sugar and, 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 and body parts. And that's how they did it. The, the body, you know, the organic chemicals are, are, are carbon dioxide with a lot of hydrogen and keep building them up. Uh, green sulfur bacteria invented photosystem one and purple bacteria invented photosystem two. Uh, in order to separate water, hydrogen from oxygen and water, you need an enormous, a lot more energy than you do to, 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 to make this separation. And what, what, what the cyanobacteria did was maybe through lateral gene transfer, they grabbed this photosystem two, they grabbed photosystem one so they could, could harness more energy. And they used that to split water. And even though it took more energy to do that, it, was, it doesn't seem like it would be energetically competitive with these guys. Uh, and then they then they use that hydrogen uh, to to fix the carbon dioxide to 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 to, to build um, organic molecules. The point is, is hydrogen sulfide only exists in certain places, so <clears throat> it's it's not ubiquitous. Whereas H two O is everywhere, and uh, and so these guys could compete favorably against these other guys, even though they they had this energetic more energetic process they had to to take take it do. Uh, they, they started around uh, 2.7 billion years ago. And so there was oxygen whiffs. And, and then finally, the great oxidation event where, where they released enough oxygen that they actually changed the, um, the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, oxygen, as it turns out, is, uh, is toxic. And it was toxic to the methanogens and the, and the purple bacteria and everything else that was alive then. So it caused the, a big extinction event. Uh, and, uh, but it was also toxic to the cyanobacteria at first, so, which is why it, it, it appeared and then, then retreated and appeared, retreated, appeared, retreated. And finally, the cyanobacteria had developed a mechanism to, to, to withstand their own waste. And, uh, and then they went full boat. Um, this is the first example of, a, of a species inventing, uh, um, an organism inventing a, a, a process, um, um, a, a meta metabolic process that, that when it got out of control, well, we're happy that it did, but, but at the time all those methanogens weren't. And 
there was there was nothing to slow it down. There was not no uh, 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 we have photosynthesis and respiration today, and that they're in balance and they maintain oxygen at, at an appropriate level. But there was no respiration here. Nobody had invented respiration. So these guys uh, they grew exponentially and um, and out of control, caused an extinction event because of the oxygen, but also by pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then dying and get burying that carbon dioxide that, uh, that caused the snowball earth. And, and so this is what caused the snowball earth. Um, this, is, this is what happens with photosynthesis. It draws carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, combines it with water, releases oxygen. And and, uh, and 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 has molecules of uh, of uh, organic molecules. Photosynthesis um, of uh, a pho photosynthesized oxygen now that it's in the atmosphere uh, reacts with the atmospheric methane, which again is another potent greenhouse gas, and pulls it out of the atmosphere. So both carbon dioxide and 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 and, and methane were being pulled out of the atmosphere, causing the Earth to free, and it literally froze over to the equator. Uh, it was recovered eventually by volcanoes releasing CO2. And uh, so that was the first snowball earth event. And, um, and then reducing to oxidizing, well, I, I kind of explained that. And uh, this is the first mass extinction event, and it was caused by cyanobacteria, as I said. So uh, there was a Kenilworth supercontinent formed and broke up, and that also contributed to the to the... To, you know, it was a perfect storm that was ha happening at the time. Um, so we, we're now entering the Proterozoic. We have an oxygen oxidized atmosphere and we now have an oz ozone layer. And um, so the Proterozoic is bookended by a lot of interesting uh, um, geological stuff, snowball earths, uh, glaciation, banded iron formations. That's where the, this oxygen reacts with all the iron that's in solution in the oceans and forms these uh, bin, uh, rust, basically. And that's where we get all our iron today uh, in, the, in iron mines. Uh, the Kenilworth supercontinent, and there was also a, uh, an impact, a big impact at 1.8 billion years ago. So there's a lot of activity at the beginning of the Proterozoic. And then nothing happened between 1.8 billion years ago and 800 million years ago. And, they, and, and so geologists call this the boring billion. But, and at the end, it's bookended by another set of snowball earths, two of them at least, the Marianoan and the Sturdian. Uh, another supercontinent forms and breaks up and more banded iron formation. So, so, so you have a whole lot of geological activity. But in the middle, there was hardly anything at all. But for life, even though the geologists find this boring, in life, everything happens. So eukaryotes form, those are, those are what we are, we're eukaryotes, uh, they, we, they invent sex, they invent respiration. So now we have respiration photosynthesis and so now we can keep that oxygen level um, stable. Uh, fungi and algae, uh, multicellular red algae, cell differentiation of eukaryotes, uh, um, heterotrophs, amoeba heterotrophs, multicellular eukaryotes, all kinds of things happen to life. Basically, Everything that needed to happen for complex life happened during the Proterozoic. <laughs> and um, of course, the geochemists thought it was the, 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 the boring and, uh, and other geochemists thought it was smelly. And that's because the oxygen level here was, was only about one or 2% of, or, or to maybe 10% of what it is today. So it didn't penetrate the deep ocean and the deep ocean still maintained that sulfur hydrogen sulfide, that, uh, that, that chemistry. And so pro probably the earth smelled. <laughs> that was why Linda Koss says it was the most smelliest time on earth. Uh, biologically, it was a revolution. So this is the characteristics of a pro prokaryote cell. And this is the characteristics of a eukaryotic cell. And Prokaryotic cells are all kind of similar, although there's two totally different uh, domains, uh, bacteria and, and archaea, uh, but they are vastly different than eukaryotes. So this is, this is uh, much, I don't, you don't need to know all this stuff. You just to see that there's a lot of new red stuff here and, and, and uh, replacing all this green stuff. So this is a massive evolution and it might've taken 
uh, uh, you know, a billion years for, for, for this whole thing to evolve. And this is what the Proterozoic, near the end of the Proterozoic, what, what life looked like. So it was all soft bodied. There was no beaks, no bones, no, no teeth. So nothing really to form good fossils. So, so uh, it, it was hidden from uh, uh, paleontologists for a long time before they figured out how to, how to look for this stuff. Uh, but but they actually even even discovered uh, neuron cells. So so brain cells uh, were, were 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 formed at, at this time. So so pretty much everything we need for complex life was formed then. Okay, so we're going to skip past the 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 to to the end, which is the Phanerozoic. This is the last five hundred and forty million years, and this is complex life has already formed. This Cambrian explosion took place. And uh, so we're missing, a, we're, we're skipping a lot of interesting stuff, but we don't have time. The, um, we're going to focus on just some of these arrows where the environment influenced life and some of the arrows where life influenced the environment. Um, uh, it, it, in, in particular, the end order vision um, uh, happened. That was an extinction event that was caused by moss. And, and what happened was, is up to this time, the continents were empty of any kind of life. They were just bare rock. And uh, maybe they might have had microbes, but we haven't found any evidence for that. So, um, or scientists haven't. And, uh, and what Morse figured out, so, so Morse started the, uh, from, from the oceans and they, and they would... Um, inhabit the continents right at the at the at the at the boundary between the oceans and the and the uh, and, and the continents where they needed a lot of water they they they, they discovered how to make a hard shell for their spores uh, so their spores could survive dry conditions and that way that when they when they launched their spores into space they could travel inland over the rocks and, and as long as they found a little bit of water, they could, they could uh, develop into, into, into moss. And, uh, and moss also developed some acids that they could, they could leach out of rock the, uh, the necessary elements for life, the, 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 the uh, phosphorus and, and, and the nitrogen in particular. They, 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 compared to weathering of, of rock, by, by, by other processes, um, moss can get about 70 times the phosphorus and, and two, two or 300 times the iron. And they, and they can also leach out all the other uh, important minerals. That was all cool for the moss. Problem is, this is such a great way to make a living and there's nobody on the continents but them. So there's no uh, competition. Uh, there was no predators and they could just have a great happy time but that, but all of this, uh, these uh, uh, nutrients were flowing down rivers into the ocean, causing ocean eutrophication and and anoxia. This is exactly what's happening today with our with our factory farms, where we dump a lot of chemicals on farms, and all those chemicals, uh, the, um, the, uh, the the fertilizers run run into the in, into the estuaries and so forth and form dead zones and there's now 500 dead zones around in the oceans today from our from basically from from farming and the biggest one that i know of is in the gulf of mexico and it's the size of new jersey and so it's, it's due to all those farms in the midwest uh, using uh, uh, artificial fertilizers and then running down the mississippi uh, so this is the same process and it caused an extinction event um that, that happened again uh, uh, in the Devonian uh, by vascular tissues. So vascular tissues and discovered how to make roots. And when they made roots, they could they could expand their reach into the continents. And because they could they could break up rock and form soil with their roots, and they could expand the the weathering of rocks and extract even more uh, nutrients. And then and so it happened all over again eutrophication. And an oxygen, another another extinction event. Uh, okay, so so those are the, those are the three that I know of that were that extinction events, and they were major extinction events. They were, these two were two of the five, and then of course we only count the Proterozoic, so we don't or Phanerozoic, so we don't count the other one as a, as one of the five. 
and uh, and uh, so I, I want we could talk about the Carboniferous. Um, the, the 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 vascular tissue when when the, when when these guys invented wood um, lignin, uh, they no 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 organism could digest the uh, the wood, and so all that wood for sixty million years. Uh, fungus and, and bacteria couldn't digest it, nor could termites, insects. So it would fall over and it would rot. And, and so um, I'm going to show some pictures now. So this is the, before we talk about that, I'm going to talk about the first, uh, the first uh, tic tac like the first land animal. And Neil Shubin, Your Inner Fish, it's a really good book. He's the guy that discovered this thing. Uh, it's a really cool story. And uh, if you want to know more about Plant Life and How It Evolved, uh, The Emerald Planet by David Beerling is a good book. Uh, th those are accessible for lay people, although those guys are, are, are scientists, es especially Neil Shubin, you Fish. fish. It's a, a kind of a must read. So here's Tic Tac Lick. It's a, it's a aquatic animal. Uh, it, it crawls up onto land. Uh, there's a lot of big things like mass... <laughs> big massive sharks and, and all kinds of nasty stuff up here. And up, up here, there, there's no predators for it and a lot of food. So the eventually, after after a certain amount of time, Tic Tac uh, discovered, developed lungs and the ones that developed lungs uh, were successful at, 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 at uh, and colonizing. So these are our ancestors. That's your inner fish. Now, this is what the Carboniferous look like. So these plants, they discovered lignin and, uh, and, and grew these woody parts. And the reason they did that is, is, in a, is in a competition to, to get as high as possible to trap sunlight. And uh, so it was, a, it was an arms race. And when they would die and fall over, though, nothing could, uh, could, 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 could eat them. And then so they all uh, got buried, and that's our cold today. Virtually all our cold comes from, from this period. Uh, and th this paper was published in 2021, and it's pretty interesting. Be be the oxygen levels rose to about 30 35%. And because of that, dragonflies uh, had a two-foot wingspan. We see this enormous uh, insects and bugs. This bug was eight feet long and weighed 110 pounds. So if you if you don't like bugs, you would not want to would not have wanted to live in the Carboniferous. Now this is this is complex. Um, see how to explain this. This is uh, this is latitude. Actually, it's sine sine times the latitude if you're mathematically inclined. So this is 90 degrees north. This is the equator, and this is 90 degrees south, the South Pole. And this is the temperature over the earth to slices through time from 540 million years ago to today. And so you could see uh, today, um, you know, the, the, the temperature is mild. There's not, there's not really a lot of red. We're in an ice age and we have ice at the, at the poles. And, and this has happened at other times too. Uh, the Endordovician uh, sharp drop in carbon dioxide and a sharp drop in temperature and then a recovery. Um, Endovonian was a two-step drop and uh, but it still remained fairly warm but it but but it still did a number on a lot of species to, to be a uh, a big extinction event. And then and then we get the uh, what do you call it the carbon carboniferous period. And, and this was an ice age. So you, so you get ice forming at both poles. At the end of the Permian, uh, we get enormous volcanic eruption and we get the end Permian. And this is the hot, this is really a hot time. And, it, and, it, and the, and the, uh, and the, um, the, the temperature rose rapidly. And um, so we're gonna compare the, this is the best analog, unfortunately, for what we're doing today. Okay, so we talked about two mass extinction events caused by by um, by life: the Endordovician caused by moss, and the Endivonian caused by vascular plants. I made a table here, so that includes the cyanobacteria, uh, and and the innovation was oxyphotosynthesis, acids, root systems, and and the present the Holocene extinction. Uh, again, a single organism, human. 
And, and our metabolism that's causing all the problems is fossil fuel metabolism. It's extremely successful in, term, in terms of us in the short term. Uh, and, and then chemical farming, which is using fossil fuels, overexploitation, which is enhanced because we have uh, speedboats, uh, habitat destruction uh, and pollution, all fossil fueled. And, uh, and, it's, and, and this is what it's causing. And so it's, it's nutrient runoff, which, which we saw in these other two episodes. Uh, we have 500 estuary dead zones, increases carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases causing global warming. And, and then all kinds of pollution, nasty pollution, endocrine disruptors, which cause infertility. So what we're doing has happened in the past. We're repeating the past. We're just out of control. We have no predators. Uh, we, 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 the only way we can control ourselves is with, with our frontal cortex. <laughs> and we have to do it, the entire species has to agree to do it. Um, and that's, in the end, that's what the solution is going to be if we can do it. Okay, so that's that. And, and now I'm going to talk about one more thing and then we're going to, and then we'll be done. And this is the Siberian large igneous province province and that caused the end permian extinction that one i showed you that got really really hot and uh and and the, i i talked about the first two major extinction events these are the next three that to form the big five the end permian the end triassic and the end um, cretaceous and uh, the cretaceous ended with a with an impact and also with uh, with a large volcanic uh, activity uh, th th these large uh, circles are where where the uh, lava covered in excess of four million square kilometers. So massive stuff. Um, and there were other big ones too. And uh, the reason why didn't these form? They all formed extinction events. Now see, these are all extinction events, and that's pretty bad when you lose uh, you know 18, 15, 18, 20 percent of your genre. That's not a, a good extinction. It just doesn't make it into to get classed into one of the top five. The reason these guys didn't get get that to that level is because they took a long time. So th there's two factors that, that 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 determine how bad an extinction event is going to be. Is 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 one is is the is the total amount of of the damage obviously, but also the speed of the change. So if the change happens really slowly, a lot of organisms can adapt. And so, so it won't be a great extinction event. Uh, so that's why these didn't form major extinction events and these three and the other two did. Now, this is an the best analog for the current crisis. 96% of plants and animal species go extinct and 99% of all life per. So even the the species that survived didn't survive in great numbers. So this is what happened. It was a volcanic activity uh, for, for about 500, uh, you know, it's a 500 million, 500,000 years, no, 300,000 years in what's modern day Siberia. And so that spread the lava, like I said, the, the basalt rock over, um, over in excess of four kilometers. Uh, at, at some point it got plugged up and, uh, but no worries, the, the hot magma could burn through uh, the, the sediment, carbon rich sedimentary rock that it was, that it was going through. And it could do that with ease because this was all coal and it buried, burned through all that. And it didn't emit its uh, stuff, its gases until it got to the perimeter. So it gets to the perimeter and, and it releases a typical volcano will release less than a, um, a million tons of carbon per year. I mean, I'm talking about the big volcanoes. So the little ones don't don't emit anywhere near that much. But 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 the you know but but this is about how much carbon gets sequestered at, at the boundary between uh, oceans and 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 um, and, uh, and and continents every year. So it's imbalance, more or less imbalance most of the time. This was a billion tons of carbon in, in terms of carbon dioxide every year for, for about 10,000 years. So it's a billion tons of carbon dioxide. 
And this is what it did. It, it caused an extinction event between 30 South and 30 North. Uh, these land forms, uh, land have no fossils. There's no fossil record for this time. And in the North and the South, there are fossils, but they're sparse. And, and so some things survive, they survive near the poles. This is what it would look like today. It's half the Earth's surface. Um, the the end Permian, this is all the stuff it did. It was uh, anoxic oceans, uh, uh, ocean acidification, uh, and then the and then one billion tons of uh, of carbon. What what are we doing today? Uh, well, we're sea levels rising about forty five millimeters per year. Um, it's a uh, uh, four, this should be 4.5 millimeters per year, sorry. Uh, it's uh, extremely uh, high uh, ocean acidification rate. Uh, and that's, that's what's happening in those uh, dead zones. Uh, and, and ocean acidification is, is high. There's an ocean and knock, well, it's actually hypoxic ocean. This is from this paper by Britberg. Who, who taught in the University of Maryland, and, uh, but she's since retired. I asked if she would give a talk. Uh, but she's retired. Uh, and Permian, um, it, the, the oceans were anoxic. Um, and, and here's the thing, the carbon emissions that we're doing today are 10 billion tons of carbon in the form of CO2. So we're, we're releasing carbon dioxide 10 times faster than the greatest extinction event of all time. But when you add in the, the effect of other greenhouse gases and, 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 and calculate a CO2 equivalent, uh, it's it's equivalent to 16 gigatons, okay? In addition to all that, so our total emissions so far are, are 650 gigatons to 10,000, so it's all, it's like less than 10%, uh, but it's at, at 10 times the rate. Um, but we're doing all this stuff that didn't happen then. Uh, we're, we're, we're spreading diseases and invasive species because of all our trade, international trade, uh, pollution, like endocrine disruptors and plastics, over over exploitation, uh, uh, loss of habitat. I mean, we're just taking land away from wildlife to turn it into 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 farms. Uh, not not just to feed us, but to feed our cars too. Unfortunately, uh, and and and, it, and we've also disrupted the phosphorus and nitrogen cycles. Um, so, so we're doing a lot of stuff that didn't happen at the end Permian. Um, faint young sun paradox again, at the end Permian, the sun was only 98% as bright as it is today, which meant that it was less sensitive to carbon dioxide. So to get a, the, the 300 parts per million uh, of carbon dioxide that, that we associate with the, with the Holocene, you would have to have more than twice that amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, so uh, so now you take the thirty-two times and you uh, sixteen times you multiply that by two again and you get thirty-two times. Uh, I, this is an interesting cartoon. This is the end Triassic, which was the next extinction event. We won't cover that, but this is what happened there. You know, ocean warming, Euxenia, Noxia, acidification, and this is a comparison to what we're doing today. So we're trashing the planet. <laughs> Uh, just just like uh, what happened to these major extinction events. And this came out of a paper, uh, January 2022, so not too long ago. So we're near the end of the talk. Um, where did fossil fuels come from? They came from buried sunshine, coal from trees that did not decompose during the Carboniferous. We saw that. Oil comes from marine life that did not decompose before subducting under continental plates during the Phanerozoic. So all during the Phanerozoic, we have... Um, uh, marine life that's uh, that's 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 as as a, as a falls through the uh, through the um, through the ocean, it gets used and reused and recycled many many times. But finally, some of it ends on the floor, and some of it gets buried and uh, and gets gets subducted under continents, and that becomes oil. Uh, methane derives from both, but but there are other sources of methane, plenty of other sources. Uh, USGS USGS estimates that there are 5,000 billion tons of carbon 
in the form of fossil fuels created over 500 million years. And just do a division and you get 10,000 tons per year on average. Well, it's quite a bit more during the Carboniferous, but a lot less at other times. So it averages about 10,000 tons per year. We're using 10 billion tons, remember, of, of fossil carbon. That's what we're putting in, in the atmosphere. And that, that, that's equivalent to, to a, a million years, approximately, of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of what the Earth's secret, the Earth's activity to create the fossil fuels in the first place. <laughs> so a factor of a, of a, of a million. So these, these numbers, are, 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 are impressive, I would think. Uh, so th this is the end. And so what we have learned in this uh, part two, the habitability of a planet depends in part on whether it is inhabited. And we saw the feedback between the methanogens and creating their own environment and so forth. Uh, life is far from thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, it's a low entropy state and requires a flow of energy to maintain that state. And that's, that's what um, metabolism is all about and therefore increases total universal entropy. At least three mass extinctions were caused by a single organism developing a new metabolism and or new reproductive trick. And we saw at least three examples. Those are the only three I know, by the way. A planet probably has to be billions of years old to develop complex life. And so when you look at those five eons and you try to think of how you could compress them into a smaller amount of time, it becomes hard. I mean, maybe you could do away with, with some of the boring billion, but you, you're not really sure. And maybe the Archean went on for a little longer, but it seems like a planet really has to live last for about at least a couple of billion years to get to the point where it can host complex life. It's, it's going to start with a... Um, it's going to start as a ball of fire. It's got to cool off, and then it, it's going to have a a, a reducing atmosphere. It's got to got to get oxygen somewhere, and so forth. Uh, we're emitting carbon dioxide ten times faster into the atmosphere than the most extreme event during a Phanerozoic, and that was the worst extinction event of all time. And we are burning about a million years of sequestered carbon every year, and uh, just a comparison to to these other events. So the only conclusion I can come up to is that anthropogenic climate change denial is a form of mass psychosis, and we'll show that uh, as we proceed. The next talk is the evolution of civilization. Thank you. Okay, I stopped my... Uh...